All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual shouting session here at Hearts for Health. Today, we're joined by Dr. Suzutek. So to give a quick introduction over um, Dr. Suzutek, she's an OB Joyan, a board certified OB Joyan, and serves as the course director for physical diagnosis in the Department of Primary Care at Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine. She also serves in quite a few other leadership roles, um, a big adv advocate of both OB Joyan and also um, education, also osteopathic medicine in general. And I'm excited to say that we're happy to have her here to have insight across the board from um, all of that. So I know that a lot of you have requested OB as a, a speaker specialty that we have, and I'm glad to see that we do have this um, going for us today. So that's all for an introduction. Just a few quick reminders before we do begin for those who are listening. Um, if you're new to the program, we'll have a Q&A towards the end. So towards the last 10 to 15 minutes, uh, you have the chat there that you're um, that that is under the video that you're viewing, so you can type in any questions you have for Dr. Suzutek, and we can get to them at the end of the Q and A. Um, again, the last 10 to 15 minutes will be reserved for the Q and A. Also, if you're not familiar, you can stay updated with future chatting ses sessions through the Instagram page that we have, and we'll post our upcoming sessions on the week of, usually the Tuesday of. Um, uh, or before I should say shouting sessions so that you'll be notified and updated over that. We also have our listserv where we send out email announcements over future shouting sessions. And you can either subscribe to our website or email us at shadowing.h, the number 4h at gmail.com to be added onto that listserv for more updates. Um, I think that really wraps it up in terms of reminders and an introduction. So feel free to take it away, Dr. Zuzek. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and hello everybody. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on my pathway. I'm going to go over some of the things that I do in my practice, as well as what I do at the medical school. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that today. So my background story, I was a biochemistry major. I went to Stony Brook University and actually, you know, really loved biochemistry and, you know, thought maybe I would go into medicine or maybe I would go into some type of other, you know, healthcare type of field, but I wasn't sure at the time. And I was encouraged to apply to pharmacy school through, through one of my advisors. And so I did, and that I went to St. John's University in Queens, New York, and completed my program there, became a pharmacist. And all of, you know, all of these programs have exams and licensing exams. So I took all of that and I ended up working for a pharmaceutical industry. And as I was working for a pharmaceutical industry, I realized that I still had a love for medicine and just wanting to take it to that next step where I could prescribe and 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 not just treat, but manage and, you know, partner with the patient. So hence uh, medical school was next. I went to the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine, again, finished that program. So undergraduate was four years. Pharmacy school was another two and a half years. Medical school is four years. Um, and, you know, a variety of licensing exams that go through that and then residency, which is another four years. So you can see, you know, it is definitely a commitment that you have to put into it if this is what you want to get out of it. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I really enjoyed it. And again, you know, board certification. So more exams and more, you know, maintenance of certification, all the things that go go along with um, maintaining all your degrees. I have a, a quick video that the school did that really kind of shows a little bit about my path about the school. So I just want to show that right now. My father had a heart attack when I was 12 years old and I was with him when he had it. So I felt pretty helpless at that time. And I was like, I wish I knew more, like what else I could have done to help my father. Through high school, I rode for the emergency medical services, helped with CPR classes. I ended up going to pharmacy school first. And then once I finished that, then I applied for medical school. This is my hometown, where Torcom Middletown is. And when I found out that they were repurposing this hospital for a medical school, I thought the town really needs this. So I contact them and said, what can I do to help? How can I be involved? And here I am now. <laughs> Patients don't always share with us everything that they're feeling, or maybe they're having some challenges in expressing how they're feeling. So we really need to be in tune to 
their nonverbal cues. Because Orange County just has apple farms and horse farms, we're able to integrate that into the program. We reached out, we, de we developed a protocol and a whole program together that really helps students learn nonverbal cues. Horses, they have this ability to to respond to humans. So if you're being too assertive or if you need to slow down to get the horse to respond to what you need, then you're learning that your actions can also impact how a patient can respond to you. I always loved the professor that I had who just took a challenging topic and made it really clear. So I always have that goal to really energize the students, make things a little bit more fun, but also keep in mind the seriousness nature of the information that we're learning and how to apply it to patients. We use imaging and we use all those types of technologies to help us, but we tell them not to forget that you have your ears to listen to the patient and you have your hands to get to a diagnosis as well and to use that to be the best physician they can be. I'm Dr. Stephanie Zizutek. I am an assistant professor here at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. Welcome to Toro. Okay, so that's a little bit about my role with Toro and all that I do at the school, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail. I still also have a clinical practice where I see patients, so I really try to balance all of it to, to really not you know, lose that connection with patients, but also impart that you know, knowledge and information to the students as well. So just to you know, ask like, what is an OBGYN? So what does it really encompass? So you can see obstetrics and gynecology. So from everything that goes along with management of a pregnancy, you know, also even before patients get pregnant, they can come into your office to ask you about what they need to do to best prepare to get pregnant. How can they be their healthiest to get pregnant? To all the things that you have to deal with when someone is pregnant from an ectopic pregnancy to any issues with the baby that maybe the baby has to be delivered early, high blood pressure, preeclampsia. Um, then we could you know, talk about the placenta and are there C-sections or vaginal delivery. So all the things that go along with it. To gynecology where we have care for the reproductive health of women from the time of menarche to postmenopausal. And I actually see very young patients at times too for some medical issues, all the way until there's no end limit to any age, you know, we really can see patients. And I'll go over a little bit more in detail about some of the very common things that I see in the practice, but um, irregular menstruation, infections, cancer, any growth masses, things like that, surgeries, and, and so forth. And then if you want to take it to that next step, there are um, additional training programs and fellowships that you can do afterwards. So we have maternal fetal medicine, so that's really care of that high-risk pregnancy, which can be someone who has some systemic medical problems to someone who has twins and triplets and beyond. So it could be for many different reasons where we need someone who um, has that you know, en uh, enhanced level of training as well. Then there's um, GYN oncology, minimal, minimal invasive surgery. So all the laparic surgeries where we put just like a small scope and make a small incision in the patient to be able to see inside their whole abdomen. There's also reproductive endocrinology and fertility for patients who uh, sometimes have trouble getting pregnant, um, as well as a variety of other endocrine issues that they may need to see them. There's also female uh, pelvic reconstruction surgery, and then pediatric and adolescent gynecology. So you can specialize, you can subspecialize in many of these things. Sometimes your practice might lead you down this direction because you just have a, a large number of patients in that type of uh, category that you want to take care of. So there's lot, lots of options that you can do here. And then as you know, teaching can be part of it and um, farm school industry, all those kind of things that can still be added to this too. So day in the life of an OBGYN. So touching upon that, you know, in general, the days are really not the same. You can have a day where you're just in the office. You can have a day where you're in the office and then in the hospital. You might just have a day that you're in the hospital. Are you on call? Are you doing a night shift? You know, what may be happening? So it can be very, very variable. So if you don't mind getting a call at two o'clock in the morning at times, then this could be the field for you. But if that's not your, <laughs> is that if that's not your allowed to get called in the morning, um, and you will get called very early in the morning, um, then you have to see how, who are you as a person and how you want to, you know, have a life outside of your residency. So we do a lot of preventative care, screening tests. We do have definitely a segment of primary care. In fact, OBGYNs often fall right in the middle of that category where you define it as a primary care provider as well as a specialty provider. So we really cover both ends of that spectrum. We do uh, different surgical cases. 
We do many procedures inside the office as well. So if there's biopsies, um, IUDs, um, ablations, those type of things we can often do inside an office or we can go into a radiology center or, or mini surgical center. So there's lots of things that we can do outside of the hospital as well. Antipartum care. So if your practice is full OBGYN, you're going to see a lot of patients who are pregnant and they're just coming in for a general checkup, delivering babies, uh, patient continuity. So I'm not... I'm going to mention the OB hospitals too much right now because that's kind of a separate category that's for someone almost is like an emergency provider that works in the hospital, but they can cover just labor and delivery, but they can also cover the emergency room. They can assist in different surgeries, but they generally, um, many OB hospitals don't have a separate practice. Although on your, you know, some days off, some, some OBGYNs who have their own practice may want to do additional hours that they can also do some type of coverage like that too. And then they may not get that patient continuity of care. But in a general practice, we often, you know, have this patient continuity of care. In general, we do have a healthier patient population, but we certainly have patients who have some very serious medical conditions, systemic disorders, uh, cancer diagnoses, those types of things too. But because we have such a wide range of ages and we do a lot of preventative care, we do have a lot of healthy patients as well. And again, seeing patients from young to old, and then keeping up to date on new medical info. I throw that on there because in the day of the life of an OBGYN, I'm often going online to the American College of OBGYN or the U.S. Task Force, something where I confirm and double check some of the most up to date information on how you manage things. Because even over the past decade or so, there have been so many changes in the recommendations of how often to screen a patient for a mammogram. What age do you start? When do you start pap smears? So it's, it can be quite variable and it, and it does change over the year. So you always want to keep up to date and make sure that you're keeping up with the most, um, in, you know, uh, present information that is there to manage that patient, new medications that are out there, all of, the, all of the above there. And this is just some of the most comments that I mentioned that I would see in a typical week, for example. So lots of patients come in for abnormal bleeding in any fashion, whether they are spotting, heavy bleeding, they're missing periods, anything that's just abnormal. Um, so of course with Ms. Menses, you know, if I had a group of students with me right now, I'd say, what's the first test that you would order, you know, if someone has a Ms. Menses? And I know all of you are saying right now, a pregnancy test, absolutely, you definitely wanna get that first to make sure that that's not the, you know, reason why someone is Ms. Menses, because that is a very common reason for that. Pelvic pain, urinary tract infections, vaginal infections, breast masses or pain, any hormonal disorders, infertility, and birth control. These are very, very common reasons that I see patients pretty much weekly uh, on this type of thing. There's other things. This is just a, um, a very common list, but certainly not all inclusive of all the things that we can see in our office in a typical month even. Now, I just want to bring together examples of topics for medical students. So I teach all the women's health courses at the medical school, as well as, you know, when you're a physician, you really are teaching your patients. You're helping them better understand their diagnosis. You're helping them know what's going on with their own body. You know, maybe they've done some research themselves and they've tried to look up some information. So we want to know what do they know? How can we help clarify it? How can we help confirm what they do know? So this is just a general example of what we review with the medical students. And then as the students finish their preclinical years, they go into the clinical years and then into residency. So this is an ever evolving and you're adding more and more information, but you wanna have a good foundational knowledge of many of these topic areas. So, um, you know, just going from mental disorders to any contraception, to bleeding issues, infertility that I mentioned, cancers, even osteoporosis. So you know, I didn't have it on the weekly list, but I certainly see that several times a month where patients have risk factors, they need to be screened for it. Then we talk you know, about different breast masses, sexually transmitted um, infections, any discharge that's abnormal we want to address, any bleeding that's abnormal. You know, How old is the patient that might be having some issues? If it's someone who's in menopause and they have bleeding, you know, absolutely must be worked up, rule out cancer until otherwise you, know, you figure out what might be going on with that patient. And then, um, all the different types of deliveries, how you can assist patients with delivery in the prenatal care, um, baby care, you know, collaboration with other doctors who work with that patient too, from the pediatricians, neonatologists, um, maternal fetal medicine. So we, we really want to work together to make sure that, you know, healthy moms, healthy babies. 
So when I worked with uh, the medical students and they go into their clinical rotations, I asked them to share with me what is their experience like when they go out on their rotations because I wanted to see how it compared to what they learned in the preclinical year. So we can see here that they often have these 12-hour shifts or these long shifts at times, and they might have it during the day or they could have the night shifts. And they're seeing a variety of vaginal delivery C-sections. Um, they're on labor and delivery quite a bit. They can assist in vaginal deliveries too. So they can really be present. They want to be engaged with the, the doctor that they're working with to really show interest and ask questions and, and be prepared. You know, if you know the cases for the day, if you know someone is coming in who has um, maybe a fibroid uterus that the patient's pregnant and how do you manage that patient? So you want to review that stuff even before you help out for the day so that you can really understand what's going on. ER consult, so the ER might call you to um, see a patient in the emergency department. There's a variety of cases that are scheduled for GYN, but we have many cases that are urgently added to the schedule that were not known until that day, for example. So that can um, happen all the time. Um, you wanna interview patients, get a good history, or make sure all the information is in the chart that is needed, helping prep the patient, help, helping move the patient in, does a patient need a catheter? Or can you assist? Can you can you really be a support for the whole team that's there? Many times, as a medical student, or you know, if you're a pre-health student, you're and you have the opportunity to shadow a doctor in the operating room. You know, sometimes they may have you retract, um, which is is not a, a bad deal because you can still see what's going on. You can ask questions. You can learn a little bit more about what's going on holding the camera even, you know, for the laparoscopic surgery. So you'll see everything highlighted on a big screen, which I'll show a few pictures as we move forward here. And then you might not just be in the hospital. You'll often be in some type of clinic where you're going to help assist patients um, with uh, getting to exam rooms. You might, they may have you do some vital signs. They may have you assist either handing them equipment or maybe they'll have you perform certain techniques usually pap smears maybe, biopsies and, and colposcopies usually are more observant type of things. Helping out with prenatal visits if it's a routine care patient and uh, you want to uh, listen to the fetal heart, oftentimes students can actively be involved with that and patients are, are usually um, more, more than happy to have the student there because it's not an invasive procedure and it's, you know, actually can be, you know, a really happy occasion, you know, for all, everyone. So they tend to be fine with the students there. Post-op visits, so patients come back to the office, usually with a couple of days or a week or, or a couple of weeks after a procedure, um, performing the pap under supervision. So it could be a variety of things, depending on the office, depending on your interest, depending on your, um, your knowledge base and, and how prepared you are as well. And then they just listed the hours of what they did for a day uh, while they were on labor delivery. So they're getting up very early, as you can see, so 5.30 in the morning, and of course, depends what time you have to get to the hospital and how far away you are from the hospital too. So, you know, this student apparently hits their alarm quite a few times, so they have to build that in that time in a little bit, right? So baking lunch, you know, grab breakfast, run out the door. And then she says, listen to pimp podcasts in the car. So there's all these different podcasts that you can listen to that really help explain different medical disorders and how you manage things. So this was one of the ones that she listened to to really get her, um, you know, using your time management well, where she's driving and she's able to, to do stuff like that. So rounding on patients, getting patients prepared for the OR, doing sign out with the team that was already there, checking the schedule, see if there's changes. There can always be changes that happen last minute. So again, um, you're gonna be presenting to the attending that is there. You wanna introduce yourself to the patient, of course. Everyone has IDs and you have your jacket and you have all the things that are, are necessary. You know, helping with triaging patients. Um, be present for delivery. Um, circumcisions are done sometimes by OBGYN, sometimes they're done by pediatricians. So what is the protocol at the hospital that you're at? All right, so now she's getting another snack there. So she had breakfast, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta keep your wellness uh, intact also. So this is still like before 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, so she's been very, very active already. Um, so then, you know, she's still running back and forth to labor and delivery, checking um, patient labs, She's going to help out with some, a scheduled section, grab some lunch. Um, again, check on moms who are still in labor and delivery. Maybe she'll be running down to the emergency department or following another team. Maybe there's grand rounds. There might be some other stuff that's going on morning or afternoon. 
And then she has another stat section. So she's already had quite a few deliveries in, you know, even before five o'clock here, checking patients and then signing out to the next team. So you can see it's a, it can be a very, very active and educational day. But you can't always predict labor and delivery. You know, it could be just, you know, a very um, limited patients or it could be where, you know, we have, you know, multiple, multiple deliveries that are going on. So I like to just mention about the technology that we have in GYN. So we have a lot of simulators. So we have this simulator here is really helpful for medical students, for pre-health students, for OBGYNs who are in practice that might not have done deliveries for a while because you know they were just doing GYN and now they're coming back into, into the obstetrical world as well. So we have a lot of simulators that are really high tech. So this patient will blink will call out, will speak, will ask for pain management. We can have the monitors here that you can hear the sounds of a fetal heart. You can see the contraction pattern. You can see vital signs. So this, you know, is very realistic for what you would see on labor and delivery. Um, so this is a great um, tool that we use to really help us train and to run different scenarios. You know, we have um, sonograms, we have laparoscopic procedures, and we have robotic procedures too. So the, the surgeon is not even at the same table with the patient, they're off to the side. And we have a variety of instruments in to remove the uterus or remove fibroids or to lice adhesions, whatever may be going on there. And the robotic surgery can be very, very fine tuned, even more than your own hand. So it can be, really helpful for some patients who have a very complex case that would benefit from this type of procedure. You know, and just bringing other technology in, there's many, many different apps. I find that they can be very helpful for patients tracking their cycle, um, tracking their pregnancy. You can also look up different disorders to do symptom checker, you know, those type of things to see what you may have. So lots of ways that we can connect with our patients and help them help themselves, you know, in their own health care. So pregnancy care, you know, we have sonograms in our offices, we have on labor and delivery, they're in the emergency department, then you have a radiology center. So lots of opportunities for uh, imaging. You know, when I was a resident, we had this huge machine that we would roll around like all over the hospital. But now, again, you can plug it into your phone, you can have these mini laptop type of things, as well as some of the big ones that you still roll around. So many, many more options now that um, patients, can, you know, you can scan them right at bedside. You don't have to wait to bring them down to, you know, radiology center. And you can see this is um, an image of a baby here. Here's the head, the abdomen. And then we see this, you know, also. So this mom is having twins here. So there's lots of opportunities to um, see sonograms in real time as a medical student. So you definitely want to hang out with the residents who are scanning or go to the radiology center or, you know, in the emergency department to see these things. And then of course, you know, the product of what's inside here is, you know, out here and that, you know, makes it a lot of fun to, to be involved with OB patients. And then other sonogram pictures, you know, so pregnancy is a very, you know, big reason why we do all these sonograms, but that is definitely not the only reason. So here we want to look at a patient's uterus. We want to look at the ovaries. We want to look at the tubes. We want to see what's going on, the bladder, all the things that we can look at. So here we want to look at the, the lining. So this one happens to be a normal endometrium. So on the field, you'll see like the measurements and what's normal. You also want to know where someone is in their cycle. Because if this patient is near the time of menses, this is going to be a little bit thicker because this is the endometrial lining, which is going to be shedding when she has her menses. But we see here, this one is a little bit thicker. So do we need to investigate this a little bit more. Is this covering a polyp or something that might be inside? So we have a polyp here, but if someone has a very thick endometrial lining, um, you might not always see the polyp. So here we put some fluid around here, like a what we call hysterosalpingogram, and we're able to see the polyp a little bit better on this on this patient. And maybe she presented because she had some irregular or heavy bleeding. Um, so we ordered this sonogram. And then intrauterine devices. We put in patients. Sometimes we need to scan them to see if it's in place or we're just confirming placement. And so here, if we know this is the the lining of the uterus and we know that this is you know where we can look for the iud and we have the uterus around here this is a bladder so a patient has a full bladder which often makes it a little bit easier to scan to to get the images that you need other common findings so i, I wanted to share with you other things that i see here so we do laparoscopic 
procedure. So we put a scope in and we see different cysts. Here we have a uterus. So the ovaries right here, we have cysts. We can see the tubes here. Here we have what's called an endometrioma. So we can see it looks bluish, right? Bluish, blackish color, which is full of blood here. And I'm showing the sonogram picture here where it almost looks like a very cloudy appearance. Whereas here, it's a simple cyst. So you can see how clear it looks. It almost looks like the bladder on the other page, right? So it's very simple. So, but it's a large cyst. So we're looking at the size of the cyst, like what's inside of it. Here, you know, if I were to question, you know, what, what is this? Well, this can be an ovary and this has hair and has teeth. So this is what we call a dermoid cyst, which often is benign, but because it has this total potential um, cells, it can, it can create things that are outside of just ovarian tissue. So here you have, like I said, the hair, and this is actually a tooth right there. Um, here we have fibroids. So we have a uterus that has these growths on it that um, are what we call fibroids. This is a polyp. So if we're looking through the cervix into the uterus, this is a hysteroscopic appearance, and this is a polyp. So this often can cause some bleeding issues for the patient. And then yet another type of imaging that we have, you know, where we can take a look at the uterus, we can see if it has this normal fill to the shape of the uterus, which is almost sometimes even like a little bit of a triangle shape. And then we look at here at the tubes and we wanna make sure that the tubes are open. So we often do this in someone who's trying to get pregnant and they've been trying for a long time and they're not sure if there might be something going on. What if they ever had an infection, a ruptured appendix, something else that maybe caused some, one of the tubes to be occluded. So we wanna just take a look and just see if that's open. So. Uh, we're able to see, you know, pictures from many different angles from, you know, from sonograms. We can also do MRIs. We can do um, hysteroscopingograms, and we can look at all these um, type of procedures, you know, to better assess what's happening on the inside of a patient. All right, so I just want to move, uh, shift gears right now into what I do when I teach at Toro. And I teach in the physical diagnosis class, which really, you know, teaches head to toe. How do you take a history? How do you evaluate all the different areas of the body? You know, from the head, eyes, ears, nose, throat, heart and lung, abdomen, you know, um, geriatrics, pediatrics, um, pregnancy care is part of it too, musculoskeletal system, neurological system. So it really covers um, many different areas. And just a, a little bit more about osteopathic medicine. Right now, there's 38 um, accredited colleges of osteopathic medicine, and that number is ever increasing. We have a few schools um, opening in Montana right now, also. So we have um, Toro has a, a branch that they are actively, um, you know, building a school right now that should, you know, hopefully be open next year. So this number will grow, and and. I'll go over a little bit, like, why are we going out to some of these areas as well? You know, we can see 25% of all U.S. medical students um, are at locations in at least 33. Now we're going, you know, increasing that number of states. So one in four American medical students choose to attend medical school, um, choose an osteopathic medical school. We can see, you know, nearly 57% of DOs in practice um, choose a primary care type of specialty. And we can see like 150,000 right now is the number that, you know, we can see the number of DOs that are in practice or soon to be in practice. And, you know, every year that number does go up. So for middle, um, for, you know, we have a Harlem campus that is our, the main campus. And we are um, another branch of that in the Middletown campus where I'm at. And then Montana will be another branch as well. Uh, we, we look at, creating a socially aware program, embracing technological and medical standards, and we really do cover all of that. So Toro is really committed to um, serving the underrepresented minorities um, and just looking at the goals. You know, um, we want to graduate the best doctors that we can to promote practice of medicine in underserved areas, increasing the number of underrepresented in medicine uh, physicians and improve health outcomes. So our bottom line is, you know, we want to see healthy patients. We want, you know, preventative care. We want to go to areas that have less access or uh, underrepresented. So um, Toro does a really great job with seeing the needs in the United States and how we can um, get students there because students who go to medical school in an area like that tend to stay a little bit more often. So it really is, um, a win-win for the community. The communities often are very, very supportive. I can tell you the Middletown community where I'm at, 
very, very supportive. They love having the medical students there. You know, we repurposed a hospital into a medical school and we are, we also have a master's program. We have now just added a, a PA, a physician assistance program. So it really is nice to um, expand. We have many more residency slots just locally right down the road. We have a hospital that's right down the road, which um, has been rated, you know, one of the most beautiful hospitals, but also, you know, it's very high tech because it's, it's a newer hospital. So we really have a lot to offer in a, you know, a, a smaller type of community. I have um, the dean of my school. Um, I, it is a couple minute video, but I think it's nice just to see all that we do at the school. I, the video really just encompasses uh, what we do. Greetings. My name is Kenneth Steyer, DO, and I'm the executive dean of the Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine. I am fellowship trained in internal medicine, pulmonary, and critical care, and have been a dean for the last 22 years. As executive dean of the Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine, I would like to welcome you to our Middletown campus, which opened in July 2014 in the beautiful Hudson Valley. We have a great team of faculty, staff, and students at this medical school who work well together to produce mutual success. In fact, our complex board scores are currently among the highest of any DO school in the country. In addition to a beautiful state-of-the-art medical school campus, we offer on-site housing and food options. In addition, we partner with the local YMCA to provide wellness programs and exercise programs. Our flipped classroom is very popular as well, allowing students to manage their time and to maximize learning. We're also blessed with a 400-bed academic medical center, Garnet Health, which is less than one mile from the school, which was recently voted the most beautiful hospital in the United States. This clinical partner provides numerous local rotation opportunities for our students, as well as access to outstanding residency programs in general surgery, emergency medicine, internal medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, and transitional year studies. Please take a minute to watch the rest of the video and see for yourself everything Turocom Middletown has to offer during this virtual tour of our campus. Welcome to Turo College of Osteopathic Medicine, located at 60 Prospect Avenue in Middletown, New York. Middletown is a small city with a population of approximately 30,000, located in the heart of Orange County, New York. We are located 65 miles northwest of New York City and are easily accessible by car, train, or bus from all major metropolitan areas. Our campus provides ample free and secure parking lots to all students and visitors and are all located within close proximity to the campus. In order to enter the main entrance at the intersection of Myrtle and Ridge Avenues, you will have to swipe into our secure facility with an ID badge that has been provided to you by our college's security department. Upon entering the main lobby, you will be greeted by our security team. The lobby provides comfortable lounge areas as well as access to the courtyard. Additionally, you'll find our self-service convenience store where fresh coffee is always available as well as an array of sandwiches, snacks, and beverages. Late night studies? No need to run down the road for snacks or toiletries. The self-service convenience store is always available to the students 24-7. Our student services department is conveniently located on the first floor right off of the main lobby. Once entering the student service suite, you'll be greeted by our receptionist and have access to the registrar, bursar, and financial aid staff in one-stop area. You'll also have access to our learning specialists and counseling services, which are privately located and available to all students. Also located in the suite is our boardroom, where faculty, staff, and students meet regularly, in person and via Zoom. As we enter the second floor, our simulation lab is located immediately to your left side. The simulation center includes a large flexible learning space, a control room, and debrief areas. The center contains advanced equipment, including high-fidelity simulators, ultrasound machines, as well as task trainers. The high-fidelity simulators include neonates, newborns, children, adults, and pregnant patients, which provide a wide variety of training experiences for our students. The OSCE Clinical Skills Center contains 13 examination rooms and two core areas. Each of the 13 rooms are designed to mirror a clinical outpatient primary care medical office and contain an examination table, sink, diagnostic wall panel, and a computer. Each of these rooms are integrated with the CAE Learning Space Simulation Capture System, containing two cameras and a two-way microphone that aid in the formative and summative training and assessment of our students. Let's have a look at our OMM lab, 
The OMM Lab is where the in-person OMM Lab sessions are held on a weekly basis. This space is dedicated for students to learn and practice aspects of the OMM curriculum on their prospective lab partners under the supervision of an OMM department faculty member. It is here that students can develop their palpatory skills fully, practice important elements of an osteopathic physical exam, and begin to master psychomotor skills necessary for a successful osteopathic manipulative treatment plan. Our anatomy wing is directly behind the OMM lab and is broken into three different sections. Here, our students can learn by dissecting donor cadavers in a well-ventilated and well-lit state-of-the-art cadaver lab. Our plasticized specimen and 3D virtual anatomy labs are an additional tool to enhance the student's learning experience. Students have access to the plasticized and 3D virtual labs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is beneficial when studying for upcoming exams. Our executive dean, campus preclinical dean, faculty, and administrative staff are also located on the second floor. Students are assigned a faculty advisor as well as a student peer mentor before the start of their first year. Let's have a look at the ground floor where you would be spending most of your time in class or in a study room. Our two state-of-the-art electronically equipped lecture halls have everything a student needs to succeed in our program. Each theater seat is equipped with individual power plugs for students' personal devices. High-powered laser projectors and additional screens make following the curriculum a breeze. We know how important it is to stay connected. That's why our entire campus provides a high-strength Wi-Fi signal that allows each student to connect up to three devices simultaneously. Let's have a look at our library. The library is comprised of two sections. Our librarian and assistant are available to assist students during normal school hours, and there's also a 24-7 quiet study library section, complete with printing area. The library offers many different tools for our students to utilize for their studies. Firstly, our library offers both electronic and paper copies of your required materials for all of your classes. Additionally, we have subscriptions to many learning databases such as Osmosis, Anatomy TV, Board Vitals, Dynamed, and UpToDate, just to name a few. We offer off-campus access through Open Athens, so you can access this content anytime, anywhere. As you probably already know, Turocom's curriculum is based on a flipped classroom modality. That means that you get to review recorded lectures prior to coming to class, giving you a leg up on the material that will be presented and discussed. In order to provide high quality video lecture content, our educational media team utilizes the on-campus green screen recording studio to record and edit all of our video lecture material in-house. We understand a student's need to have a quiet place to study privately or in a group, there are several private and group study rooms available on the ground floor. There's also a commuter kitchen, which allows students to store and heat up lunches. Our Student Government Association holds their office on the ground floor as well, which provides students with easy access to SGA members. Thank you so much for joining our virtual tour. We hope you found this helpful. As always, please feel free to reach out to our Student Services team members to answer any of your questions. So I thought that was just a really nice way to see the school and, and how they do the video. And one of the things that they don't even highlight in the video is all the research projects that students do. So on the walls, pretty much covering all over the school are all the different projects that students do. Many of them do it on campus. Some of them do it from the hospitals um, or they work with um, a physician in the area. And, you know, from case studies to surveys to you know, bench work, things like that. So we have a variety of research opportunities that we have too. So just to, you know, end out the presentation that I'm giving, just to really highlight all the different things that, you know, here's an OBGYN who really um, is involved in so many different things. And that's what I, I think is just, I enjoy so much, like having the opportunity to teach students, but also see patients. And when we teach students about interacting with patients, you can see a little bit from the earlier video just about um, this medicine and horsemanship program. So we're in a unique position just being in the Hudson Valley area that we have many farms around that have these types of programs. And specifically this particular farm that we go to has this uh, medicine and horsemanship program that helps students be able to better interact with patients. It really helps to share these nonverbal cues to better assess like, about how, 
how you are as a person and how you're presenting yourself and you may not realize how you come across and horses just based on being a herd animal and how they work um, together as a team themselves and how they respond to you. So we had a recent um, news program this past year who did a presentation on it. This one's a very quick clip, um, but I'd just like to show you just a little bit more about the program and then all of it that it benefits the students in their learning. So it's not just textbook learning that we do. And of course, you know, we had to go to Zoom a lot this year and, you know, we still integrate some of those types of classes as well. But we find that when you learn from a variety of modalities that you really get the most out of it to really understand the subject matter. You can definitely file this one under alternative medicine. A New York med school is taking a a non-traditional approach to teach bedside manner. This involves spending some time in a stable because these future doctors' patients are horses. Here's News Force Gilma Avalos. Even before they step foot inside a lab, these future doctors are getting real-world experience working one-on-one -on -one with patients in the barn. This was my first exposure with horses with ponies. Kristen Sue is a first-year medical student at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. The campus's proximity to the Hudson Valley's farms and orchards opened the doors to this exercise in communication. Equine specialists train the students to work with these animals. They'll work in teams to help horses complete different tasks, and it can often feel like leading a horse to water. You're losing support on me. A horse, like a very big horse, through an obstacle course that we made without any harness or anything. Working with horses is a lesson in listening. They're social animals that rely on communication skills to keep their herd safe. And much like the human patients these students will eventually help, these horses have unique needs and personalities. It's important to really understand the patient understand their own beliefs, what their worries are. Dr. Stephanie Zazutek is the course director. Even patients who can freely talk to us sometimes may not be able to explain clearly, or we may think that they understand something and their body language is saying something else. A small 2018 study analyzed patient and doctor interactions at general practices and showed doctors interrupted patients on average after just 11 seconds. These skills you can't learn from a textbook can help broaden the conversation. Something changed in all of you that allowed him to get closer. Outside the farm, in an increasingly digital world, bedside manner may be even more critical. Whether we use even telemedicine or some type of digital technology to meet with patients, these skills that they learn will still play a role. Really well done. Gilma Avalos, News 4 News. You can definitely follow this. Okay, so that is it in a nutshell. All of the the variety of um, experiences from, you know, undergraduate through pharmacy school, medical school, you know, teaching, you know, seeing patients. So hopefully that um, helps you, you know, see a different pathway of, you know, how someone, you know, became a physician and, and, you know, it doesn't have to be the same pathway for everybody. There's so many, so many ways that you can achieve your goals. And this is just some of my uh, contact information. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share my experiences with you. Absolutely. We're happy to have you here. And we're um, so happy to have learned so much around OB, um, especially around, you know, you mentioned physical diagnosis a lot. Uh, you went through specifics over um, what you as an OB um, and also uh, gynecologist will do what your day in the life looks like. Um, very helpful, especially being in the pre-med, pre-health population, um, to see this kind of specialty. We've had a few requests over it, so uh, we're happy to have you here. We have a few questions that we want to cover as we wrap up the end of the hour. Our first question is from a student asking, what would you say are the differences between DO programs and MD programs? Earlier, you mentioned that most primary care physicians come from DO programs. Um, is there a reason behind this specifically? Well, our, you know, our pathway is, is similar as far as having, um, you know, all the foundational medical sciences and clinical type of training that we have there. But, you know, where we're teaching, we're really teaching in, um, to help the underserved community. That's, that's a very, you know, strong goal and a mission that we have so that, you know, primary care does tend to cover that a little bit more. And, you know, we certainly add in the osteopathic component where we teach, you um, the osteopathic manipulative medicine. So we add that in, you know, we find that we can use that as another tool, as we say in the toolbox sometimes to help 
manage our patients, maybe use a little bit less medication. Does it help us, you know, with our di you know, our diagnostic skills? Are we able to determine what is going on with the patient? What systemic effects is the patient experiencing that we can identify, you know, through palpatory skills and things like that? So there we have students who go into all fields of medicine. So being an osteopathic uh, program, you know, we have our, you know, neurologists, we have our psychiatrists, we have internal medicine docs who then go into different specialties like GI, cardio, those type of things. We have urologists, we have OBGYNs, you know, of course. So students go into almost every field that is out there as well. Just the percentages of doctors who go into the primary care fields is a little bit higher, but um, you know, pediatrics is under primary care, but it also almost has like a, you know, specialty nature to it as well. Absolutely. And, and we have another question around just the general work as an OB. So medicine is by nature a collaborative profession. And with that said, do you work closely with PAs? Um, the students specifically mentioned PAs, but also maybe it would be useful to add in nurse practitioners, um, et cetera, just other allied health okay. professions. And nurse midwives, you know, on labor and delivery, those type of things too, yes. Uh, it depends on your practice. What, how is your practice situated? You know, are you, um, you know, I've throughout the years in different uh, practices that I've been in, I've, I've worked with all of the above. You know, we've worked with the PAs who was in our practice. I've worked with um, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, and it really is very variable. It really depends on the practice, how many patients you're seeing, are you seeing patients that are high risk? Are you seeing patients that are lower risk? You know, what, what can you add to your practice? And, you know, I'm hoping, I hope I answered your question there, but it's, it is very variable. It really depends on the, the fields um, or the location that you're in, the practice that you're in. And, but yes, we have PAs, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives. We have everyone in the community and I've worked with all of them in different practices. Also, to add on to that, they um, kind of segued onto a point around the, the school space. So they were just referring to how, how it overlaps between PAs, the PA program over there, and um, the medical program. Does it overlap or are they separated out? What does their education look like and, and how does it um, overlap between each other? Well, the PA program just started this January, so it's very, very new. So we don't overlap our courses. They have their own space where, they're, where they have their lectures and things like that. However, many of the faculty who teach at the medical school also will assist and teach in some of those classes as well. Um, they may share some of the spaces that we have. They may share the anatomy lab or, you know, the... OSCE lab where we do our practical examinations, they may share the space, but they're not taking the same class along with the medical students per se. And then we also have the master's program too. And there, uh, they often, you know, um, will have uh, the same faculty as well that are teaching both the medical students and the master's program too. So um, there is overlap just, you know, mostly with faculty or some of the services, but the students do have their own classes. Mm -hmm. And it was so great to see your, you know, the just the span of your career going from undergrad to then pharmacy school, medical school, you definitely have like a unique approach to it um, outside of just, you know, the traditional undergrad medical school to residency and so on. Um, and I'm sure that has, uh, in some ways here or there, has contributed to your practice being a um, registered pharmacist. So when you did enter medical school, a common question that many interviewees are faced with, even past, past interview or just before the interview, I should say, they're asked the same question, why do you choose medicine? So for you, it would be, it, it would be helpful for students to hear, you know, from an experienced physician who has been in practice over the years. From your side, what was that why when you went into medical school? So, you know, just having an interest in science, interest in, you know, how the body works, those type of things like that, you know, as well as wanting to be able to to help someone in need. You know, I mentioned, you know, my father had had a heart attack when I was young and I really wanted to know what to do. You know, I didn't want to feel helpless where I couldn't act and, and do something. So what can I do? So that kind of stimulated it even when I was very young. 
And then as I was a biochemistry major, I realized that I really enjoy the sciences and I enjoy like understanding how, you know, if a, if a patient takes this um, medication, it will help them feel better this way because it's going to help correct this. So, you know, just understanding the science and the, the, you know, overall mechanisms of the body, you know, is one part, but also, you know, seeing a patient um, who's in pain and now they're not in pain or, you know, seeing them recover or seeing how you can help them live a healthier lifestyle. You know, it's, it's really satisfying that you can really be part of that. Absolutely. And kind of a little past just medicine in general, um, when you were faced with what residency to choose, why was it OB specifically that you felt was right for you? That is a good question because when I was doing my clinical rotations, I really liked all of the specialties because I was just just so interested in learning about all of the things that medicine could offer. So what ultimately made the decision was the just the variety where you know there's not a, a day that's the same all the time. I I like having that variety. I like having just patients in an office or being in the operating room or, you know, um, you know, how are you at handling emergencies? You know, do you, are you the type of person who doesn't respond well to that? Or are you the kind who's like, okay, I'm going to um, do this, this and that to be able to manage something. So how, how do you respond to things? How do you work together as a team? And so for me, I, I knew that just having the ability to do preventative care, to do um, emergency type of care within the field, to having results also, you know, if a patient is pregnant, but ultimately they're going to deliver. So you're not waiting years, you know, and years to, you know, to help that patient, you know, um, to be, you know, I showed fibroids, you know, if you go in and the patient has heavy bleeding and you go in and you, re you remove the fibroids, which is what's called the biomectomy, and now they feel better. Their bleeding is not as heavy. They're not anemic anymore. So um, I, I felt like it was just the right fit for me with all of the, the variety of things that you could do to help patients, you know, and, and have hospital care, clinic care, all the things that go along with it. It was just the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OB really is a unique field in that you already covered this earlier, but just to restate it, it's primary care. So you have that continuity of care, um, really a lot of options with what you can do being, you know, either obstetrics or gynecology, there's, you know, differences with each. And then also, like you mentioned, the team, you're paired with midwives, nurse practitioners, nurses, um, just a great team all in all. Uh, speaking of which, we heard you mention about the midwife and nurse practitioner being involved in the general practice of OB. What's the difference between each? What can they do and what can they not do? Well, you have to see what your state regulations are um, and also what the hospital regulations are. So things may be different depending on your location. So for the, you know, for the PA who worked in our, we had a PA who worked in my practice. Um, she did have to collaborate with the physicians, you know, um, whereas some nurse practitioners can almost have like an independent type of practice. So there's, you know, many times um, there's, you know, some um, you know, the associations, like the, the big uh, national organizations that are always working to sometimes change the type of practice or to add, you know, different services or independence that's going on. So again, you always have to keep up to date with what's going on in your own community or your own state. Um, but the nurse midwife who worked on labor and delivery, she uh, delivered patients. She collaborated with the practice. She would help me as an assist when, if I had a stat section at like two o'clock in the morning, as I, I always like to say two o'clock in the morning, uh, cause it happened a lot. Um, so she would be, if she was there and she was already, you know, working with other patients who were not ready to deliver, she would come in and help me out as an assistant in the operating room. So, which was great because, you know, you didn't have to call another team member to come in and help you. You know, we all help each other. And, you know, and if she had a patient who, had um, an issue, I and I was on the floor. You know, we would you know help each other out as well. So so again, the you know patient care, getting histories, doing exams, screening tests, ordering imaging, ordering medications, all of the above. You know, all all of the nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, and uh, PAs can do all those type of things. But the nuances of how independent they can be can be variable from state to state. 
as we wrap up with last few minutes in the hour, I think a really helpful question, especially at this point um, of the session, would just be to go through how can the students listening in, some being in undergrad, some being um, maybe in a post back, you know, just in general, uh, striving towards medicine, how can they get involved with the, the field of OB? Usually it's something that you subspecialize in, or specialize, I should say, in later on in residency, years a, um, after undergrad. But for those who are interested, they wanna see what it is like to be um, part of the team, whether that be through volunteering, maybe even some paid employment, what are the possible routes that they can choose to get involved in that side of medicine? So many students even come into medical school were medical assistants, they were scribes, you know, those are very common pathways where you can get into an office and be present there for a lot of patient care and assist. You can do vital signs. You can, you know, be, become, um, a phlebotomist, you know, you can become, a, you know, LPN. I mean, there's different, you know, uh, shorter programs that some of the students do. They then work into an office and they realize they want to, you know, expand upon that. And then they look to apply to medical school. But whatever pathway that you take, uh, you can also call and you can ask. Like, I've had patients of mine ask if they could come in and shadow as well because they know me just as being my patient. And and they want to be able to get some experience that way. Um, you know, there's some telemedicine type things too that some students are maybe able to participate in depending on the practice and what type of patients are being seen that way. So there's so many different ways that you can get involved. And if you take a little zigzag to your pathway where you're taking time off to do something else or you're getting a master's degree or you're working in this field and then you decide that you wanna segue back into going to medical school, I say go for it. You know, it's never too late. You can, as long as you have an interest and a drive to have that goal to complete it, you can do it. You know, we have students that are all ages. You know, many of them are in their 20s, but we definitely have students in their 30s and 40s, and we've even had someone in their 50s before. So, what drives you? What you know brings joy to your life? That you know, for your future, what do you see? Uh, you know, some people had a career you know, for 10, 20 years, and they decided they want to try medicine because it's just the right path for them. So I encourage you to, you know, find your path and, and go for it. But if you, you know, try something else first and you want to come back to medicine, that's always an opportunity as well. All right, well, um, just maybe we can end off on one more question. Okay. Um, around your many years of experience, like I said, going from undergrad, going from pharmacy school, medical school now, now being a part of leadership positions in Turo and also outside of it. Um, I know that you're part of the Orange Medical Society uh, on the executive board over there. Um, so just in general, over those years of experience, were there any obstacles you faced along the way? I'm sure that over the years there probably were uh, many, but the main point being, how did you overcome them? Being early on in our journeys here as um, pre-med, pre-health students, we can leverage this advice that we have early on for the years ahead. And it's nice to hear how others have um, overcame their, their hurdles throughout their journey. So for you, what were those hurdles and how did you overcome them? Do you mean before applying to medical school or what, um, what are you referring to as far as the types of hurdles? Yeah, just in general, it could be medical school, residency, in the general pathway leading up to being an attending now? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you have to look at the big picture and you can see how many years it takes to accomplish your goal. So is that something that you're committed to that you want to go into? Then you have to look even at the cost of medical school. You know, what is, what goals you have and, you know, um, how, do you foresee paying, you know, for the for your medical degree and stuff and things like that? So, you know, you can most people have to get loans or, you know, just, you know, invest in themselves, I say. So those were some things that, you know, I didn't have um, the family support to pay for medical school. I had to figure all that on my own. I had to, you know, when I went to pharmacy school, as much as I loved it, I had to make a decision whether to look back to go to medicine again, because I always enjoyed medicine. I segued into pharmacy because it was a good fit at the time. 
And I'm so thankful that I did it now, though, because just having that background, a degree, it helped me in medical school. It it helped me just better understand, you know, pharmacology and all that when it went around it. And and, you know, at the time, though, you, you know, you see the time and the exams and all the textbooks and all the you know time that you're doing that. But once you're through that, you know, medical school really goes by very quickly. Students at first think, you know, it seems like this long, you know, trek that they have to go through. But after the first semester, even in the first year, they they can't believe that it went by already so fast. So so the challenges really are just, you know, just looking at your perspective and looking at the big picture. You know, is this something that you want to invest in yourself? Is this something that you can, um, you know, have support, you know, you know, because you don't want to do this alone. Also, you want to make sure that family, friends, um, you have some type of support system. So all the schools also, we have learning specialists, we have social workers, we have, we have many support systems because we know people go through a variety of, of ways of how they handle stress and how they handle exams and things like that. So, you know, so for each is person's their own struggles that they go through. So for me, I wanted to make sure that the four years of medical school plus you know, I knew a minimum of three years or any residency and then four or five years or longer if you do a fellowship. So was that something I was committed to, you know, where I have other friends who are getting, you know, married or having children or who were, um, you know, already established in their careers. And here I felt like I was kind of putting that on hold a little bit. But I, I saw, you know, the end, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I knew that I really loved medicine and I knew it was right for me. And, you know, having my family support and, um you know, paying off those school loans, you know, so it, you know, I, you know, it's, you, it's an investment in yourself and it's worth it. Yeah. I think just all in all, we can say that it might not be a hard, it might not, not but might not be a easy journey, but um, it is definitely a, a rewarding one. Definitely. I think I will wrap up uh, today's session. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. Zuzutek for joining in just a few last things for our shadowers. So for those looking um, to re receive credit for your attendance today. If you're new, we post a quiz um, and that's where you can receive your certificate. Have to at least um, get 60% correct uh, in order to receive your certificate. And we have the quiz link posted in the chat box and also on our website under the virtual shouting page. You can access it either way. Um, it's the same quiz. It will be due at 11.59 Central Standard Time, 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time on this upcoming Wednesday. Uh, March 2nd. And like I said, after passing that quiz, you'll receive the certificate with the email that you um, you listed on that quiz. We'll send it over there. But if you don't receive it, just contact us or try to check your spam folder in case. Uh, next week, though, we'll have Dr. Harris joining us to talk about internal medicine and also, coincidentally, um, another physician who was involved in pharmacy. Uh, so we'll see him on Thursday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. Central. As always, we have weekly shouting sessions. If you have any questions, though, over our shouting program or anything to do with Hearts for Health, feel free to reach out to us. Our email is shouting.h, the letter 4h, the number 4h at gmail.com. And we're pretty prompt with response over email. But I have to thank you all for joining us. And also thank you again, Dr. Suzutek, for joining us.